Welcome again, everyone, to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference, brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our sponsors. Uh, before we go ahead, I have an important uh, announcement to make. You will have in your inbox an email uh, entitled, Important Update for the GADMC Delegates. Apparently, there is a glitch <clears throat> in the schedule, especially for our Sydney audience that is looking to listen to uh, their New York colleagues, a, a four-hour glitch. So maybe you uh, you may want to visit our website and make sure that the hours are, uh, are right. At least that that uh, that schedule is is correct. Um, our next our next speakers need no introduction, but I will do that anyway. Dr. Mel Taylor uh, in the uh, in the uh, organizing committee, Slade McLean, which you you just heard from Total Fauna Solutions, David King, the no North uh, and oh, Jesus New South Wales, yeah, uh, State yeah. Emergency Service and Erica Honey from Erica Honey Consulting. Uh, it's a privilege to have you all here. Just before you, I give you the, uh, the floor. The Zoom chat feature has been disabled. So you, you please, uh, please make your questions in the questions and answer feature. I think this is the time to, to, uh, to interact with this uh, fine speakers. This year, we enabled multilingual closed captions. So if you would like to hear uh, the presentation in another language, click on the closed caption icon. And we encourage you to use the uh, hashtag GADMCConf in order to spread the word in other social media uh, elements. And as a reminder, the video recording will be available later this year after we edit it properly. The floor is yours, Mel. You will conduct the, uh, the next uh, minutes. Great. Thank you, Gerardo, and hopefully you can get back to your, uh, your, your bed soon, because we can all see it's uh, late for you there. Um, for those of us in this time zone, it's uh, around lunchtime for, for Slade, um, David and, and uh, myself, and Erica's a couple of hours different, uh, a little bit earlier for her. But wherever you're joining us from, please, um, you know, we're very pleased to have you here. As Gerardo has already said, please use the Q&A function, because we really do want to go to your questions. Um, in particular, it's important we do that because I've just worked out I've got enough questions to keep us here for about three hours. So um, if, you, if you want us to wrap up, um, Gerardo, you're going to have to come and uh, turn the, uh, the webinar off for us. Um, so what we're going to do um, to start off with is I've got some a few questions to put to the panel uh, just to set the scene. Um, you will have seen that the uh, title of this presentation or this panel session is the increasing trend of unofficial response um, in animal disasters. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, as I said, please do the Q&A function. I will nag you about that if I don't see any qu questions coming in. Um, I also took one for the team last night. So I listened into the um, US panel that had the same title as ours. So I'm hoping that I can pull in some of the things that they were talking about as well. And we can um, stitch this, um, this, this beast that is GADMAC together um, across the, uh, the time zones. So firstly, I know we've heard uh, this morning in this session from Erica and Slade already, but I know that people are coming in and out and maybe be watching the video so I'm really keen that um, each of you has a few moments just to tell us a bit about about you what sort of work you do um, in the field that brings you into contact with the um, uh, unofficial responders so uh, David let's start with you all right so I'm David King um, I'm the deputy unit commander with the uh, the Hawkesbury unit of the New South Wales State Emergencies now here in the Hawkesbury it's the uh, the biggest flood threat, threat in all of Australia. So we have a, a major river system and uh, lots of people with lots of animals that uh, do get impacted by floods. And uh, we've just gone through five back-to-back -back floods. So uh, lots of lessons learnt with the uh, unofficial response. Um, I'm also one of the lead uh, trainers for uh, large animal rescue here in New South Wales. And uh, yeah, it's basically spend a lot of my time running around teaching um, the emergency services how to get in and actually uh, work in close proximity to large animals. That's me. Thank you. Erica. Well, hello again, everybody. Um, so um, for those of you that haven't met me yet, my name is Erica, and I have a history as a veterinary nurse working in emergency and critical care for 
about 23 years or so uh, and um, working in a large uh, teaching veterinary hospital as well where I did a lot of the emergency management uh, for that facility. Uh, my other uh, part of my history is uh, working in emergency planning, so uh, master's research in that area. Um, my big goal for originally was for Western Australia to get a state animal welfare emergency plan. Uh, it took us 10 years, but we've got one, so uh, hooray. Uh, and uh, also did some honours research in veterinary disaster management back in 2011. Uh, so that's the, the history, generally speaking, uh, as well as state emergency service volunteer of 13 years. So David's over in New South Wales and Hawkesbury there. Um, I'm in Western Australia and I volunteer with the Coburn State Emergency Service. So in Coburn SES, I do uh, duty officer. Sometimes I do catering. I do a whole heap of different things. Uh, most of us SES people do <laughs> rescue as well as, as everything from PR to you name it. Um, so that is um, the general background. Uh, these days I have uh, left the university where I worked for 16 years and I now do emergency management consulting specifically for animals. So my area of specialty is planning uh, and anything to do with emergency medicine. So uh, a huge advocate for veterinary nurses, um, a huge advocate for the veterinary industry and all that we can provide uh, and as we're going forward. So any questions on planning, uh, please send them, send them my way. Ms. Slade, let's have you back. Thank you. Um, my name is Slade Macklin. I am the owner of a company called Total Fauna Solutions uh, that uh, we provide emergency management related um, services to the Department of Primary Industry and another, a few other animal welfare agencies in New South Wales. We service uh, primarily a lot of our services for wildlife um and we provide deployment capability services for some of those organizations when they want to go out in the field so not only are we looking after animal welfare and provision of that we look after their staff when they want to go out into the field as well uh, during natural disasters we facilitate um, transport and logistics with boats and trucks and again um, just facilitating pretty much anything and everything that's required in that space from a private private aspect now brilliant well thank you everybody um so last night when i was listening to the american um the the u.s panel talking about this same thing i was intrigued because they had identified three different classes of unofficial um uh, responders and i thought i'd put this to, to you i know you haven't heard this um, yet so um bear with us so they they had a, an unsolicited group and and they have got these um, these groups sort of uh, stereotyped in some respects. So they said that they're typically in the 20 to 40 um, year age range, females typically often married with kids and turn up with their 16 year old in tow to try and help. Um, but they said that this group is an easy managed sort of group of unofficial responders. They talked about the self-deployed who they um, clarified or classified as being um, groups that have a sort of a formal pro, uh, role somewhere, but, but are moving outside the scope of their authority that they have. Um, again, relatively easy to manage, but, but sort of can be problematic. And then they talked about what they called a well-intentioned, not requested group, which were the more adrenaline junkies who come with all the gear dressed up um, and keen to sort of um, you know, get, 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 get into the field and be active, um, who they tend to, to struggle with a bit more. So I thought, first thought, um, I wanted to ask you, you know, how you typically encounter some of the unofficial volunteers, whether those classifications mean anything to you as well, and whether that has different challenges for you. Um, I'll maybe start with David again. Yeah, no, that's, I think it's a, an interesting classification. <laughs> um, but uh, look, it's probably true. The, um, during our flood events, um, you know, and let's just go back a step. You know, the emergency services are the control authorities for these various natural disasters and they have a monumental task and i've heard over the last two days you know this thing about primacy of human life we can't move away from it we have a legislated role to preserve human life and then we have the animals and yes we understand the importance of getting those companion animals out and i can tell you there's a huge amount of work that we do have to ensure that families and their companion animals are being rescued but i can't send a helicopter in to get you and your horse out i can get a helicopter in to get you and your cats and dogs and smaller animals out so there are limitations and then we have 
the animals. And can I just say that social media brings this problem into everybody's computer. So someone sees an animal standing out in that floodwater and go, there is a horse standing out in the floodplain. We need to help him. Um, and then we do get these groups. And if I go to that um, unsolicited, look, we have yeah you know, little groups that sort of form. And I can tell you, we had Facebook group, Facebook groups forming from the community going, we're going to rescue these cows. You know, the, the SES can't get there. So we will form these groups to go in. And yes, a lot of them were well-meaning. And there's probably that blurring into these well-intentioned, what is well-intended, not formal groups. Um, that went out in swimming in the floodwater, yuck, on jet skis and paddle boards to go and rescue these cattle. Um, I can understand the you know, huge emotion to do it, but for me in the emergency services, that just introduced a whole heap of problems. And then we get these self-deployed groups, and we saw that more during the fires. And look, I declare I also uh, am a volunteer in the rural fire service, and we had one of the world's biggest forest fires from a single lightning strike. And this went on for months and months. And yes, there was a huge loss of wildlife. And we had folk would just turn up. And next thing you know, we're hearing that this group has turned up on the fire ground without PPE, without training, but huge hearts wanting to rescue wildlife. And it just caused huge problems. How do we actually manage these well-meaning people. Uh, once we knew they were there, we were then responsible for their safety and well, you know, they're just monitoring that, that they were there. And it's very hard for us to then say, no, you can't come onto that fire ground. You don't have the PPE. You don't have the command structures. And then we're the hated people again, because we need to manage their well-meaning huge hearts. So, um, look, yes, I, I think I, yeah, those three groups do actually sort of come in, but there's probably um, that fourth one, which is, is probably those organisations that you know, we have um, I've written down, we have Vets Beyond Borders, Vets for Compassion, all these other informal structured groups that are desperate to actually plug into that disaster and struggle to get government agencies to say, come on board, we, you can actually help out. And they get frustrated because they want to be used, but don't know how to plug into a formalized structure. Great, thank you. Let's let's move on and uh, maybe Slade, can you jump in here? Um, I agree with, um, yeah, I couldn't agree more realistically. Um, our experience has been, I, I see members of some voluntary groups, and have had that experience when they're out there in the field, they feel that frustration that they, they're seeing. They're seeing what, they're, what is portrayed on you know, uh, social media and in the news, but they don't always see the bigger picture than exactly as Dave said, you've got people out there without the appropriate PPE, they're not checked in. And then there's times when the rescuer needs rescuing when they do that. And then that's taken away from resources you know, that could otherwise have been used for animal welfare and, and, you know, services for helping people. There is a coordinated response in play, but some people don't see that for, you know, what it is. It's not on their schedule. And I'll just be really blunt and just say some people have got their own agenda that do it. Mm. Yeah, I'll return to that point actually as well. So Erica, anything else you'd like to add to um, David's um, experiences in the in the east of the country mirror any of yours in the west yeah um, I mean we sometimes actually get some of the over east groups coming out over here as well um, but I think you know having a, a solutions focus and working forward um, as we tend to do is important as well so uh, as you're both um, all of you have been talking there and plus the feedback from the previous panel uh, I'm thinking about strategy and how we can actually manage it and that I think that um, there's the certain people that will probably come on board if we actually give them an avenue to do so. So um, training and, and quick 
quick courses with low risk um, positions where they can actually assist us and we do actually need them. Um, and I think back to when State Emergency Service was first created uh, and certainly our history in Western Australia is that we were actually trained so that civilians could come on board and help out at the last minute. And so that's always in the back of our mind. How do we bring people on uh, with lower levels of training, but obviously people who are going to fit in with the values uh, and the safety precautions that we have. So obviously chain of command and um, understanding how things work and run. So for the avenue though, we can bring people in, that's fantastic. Give them an opportunity, give them low risk tasks and ensure that they've got supervision as well. For those that are not gonna come on board and maybe like, like to be kamikaze or excuse the expression, uh, what was the word you said, adrenaline junkie? No? Yep. Yep. Um, it, you know, um, good good on them for wanting to help. Um, and I think for those that can be talked into doing a quick spontaneous volunteer course and coming on board where there's a little tiny bit of action, but it's low risk would be good. Um, but for those that you can't include and won't come on board and are going to go off on their own, I think the only other way that we can do that at that point is um, managing all of the risks associated with it where possible. Uh, and in Western Australia and, and the rest of Australia, we certainly have police and vehicle control points. Um, restricted access permits in Western Australia mean that they're closely controlled and monitored if they want to come in. They will uh, not get access to those areas and we will watch for them. We know that people will try and get through um, road, road closures and things like that. So I think for the group that want to um, not follow the rules, we essentially uh, need to just put some control and command um, measures in place. And um, I think the thing that we all know is that peacetime is the most important time to have that community engagement. And so if they've got that strength um, and that um, keen interest in that area, let's get them on board early. Let's try and give them something that they can do um, that is, you know, where they're not, I want, don't want to use the term cowboy, but where they're not going to, um, you know, break the rules and do the wrong thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, we're. I mean, I was struck last night with the US panel, uh, the um, sophistication of some of the systems they have for registering people, for deploying them, for tasking them, um, and for also ensuring that things like Slave was mentioning with the um, you know, the, the other, other motives, you know, they've got uh, basically you're not allowed to take photographs and, and put up stuff showing what you're doing as part of this mm. sort of stuff as well, which I think is uh, an interesting area that I hadn't considered for sure. Um, you've already started to mention some of these things, um, Erica, in terms of, you know, we do need to think about how we can harness this capability because we know that community typically or these groups have got a lot of skills sometimes they've got equipment um, they've certainly in some cases got a lot of local knowledge as well which you know all needs to be captured and um, for those um, international um, visitors with us now we've we've just had a, a, a flood inquiry in New South Wales following the floods that David mentioned and um, there's a lot of content in there about using more of the community to get involved with response in general and finding ways to sort of train them up and give them opportunities um, to, to, to take part. And of course that's quite a challenge, the reasons that we've started to, to come to. Um, I'd really like to have a, a, a quick chat about some of those successes or some of the things that perhaps are coming in that perhaps will provide some opportunities there. So David, I know SES has got some you know, opportunities um, coming up there and, and Slade, I know you've had some successes working with some of these groups in the past. So maybe if we could pick those points up, um, David, maybe over to you. Um, okay, so look, I think you know, coming out of the, the floods, and certainly we had a major flood event up in the Northern Rivers. Um, yeah, I don't like using the word unprecedented, but I haven't seen a flood in my career of that enormity with that bigger impact. And when we talk about primacy of human life, I mean, we reached out to the community. We had people in their little tinnies going out, cutting holes in roofs to rescue families. Um, it was that bad. It went well beyond the resources of the emergency services. And then we have animals as well. So, you know, we're talking thousands of dairy cattle being washed down the rivers as well as horses drowning. So, you know, huge emotions. And the emergency services were flat out. Yet, you know, there were still people wanting to get in and help animals. And and there were some really good stories because some of those vets got together and they reached out to myself and another colleague in the SES going, we want to help. How do we do it? And we were able to provide them some great advice of how to plug into the emergency services. But if you're going to do it, 
you need to get the following bits of equipment. And they actually moved um, a great number of standing horses using flat bottom barges with portable yard panels. They got the right number. They had four vets involved. All horses were sedated, loaded, then moved down these huge flooded rivers. They had other vets on the receiving end. Um, as an emergency service person, wow, what a most professional rescue run by unofficial responders. And you know, I, I'm sort of so proud of them listening to what our advice was, pulling together amazing resources, but doing an amazing rescue. And I think it opened my eyes that there is definitely room for these groups in these major disasters when it goes beyond the usual responders. That could be the SES and police or Department of Primary Industries, local land services. And I think, yeah, in my head now is how to give them some of that basic training, how to ensure they have the right PPE and the right procedures. Because I mean, after a flood, even just decontamination from flood water, I take flood water so seriously because of the biological porridge that's in that water. But for the average punter, it's like, oh, it's just water. And they're swimming in it. Um, so how to actually give them some basic training, some basic PPE, some basic rules, and somebody to report into. And it works. And it's a, it was a, just a great case, case study of a, 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 an enormously successful rescue operation. That's exciting to hear. And Slade, how about you? I know you've had some successes with a group. Yeah, I, you know, I can see the challenges that some of the groups have come over with, like they've got training from where they came from, they're accredited from where they came from, and then they're trying to, I don't want to use the word compete, they're offering services, it's not welcomed because necessarily how the channels or communication they went down. So then they're on the ground here, trying to, you know, do the right thing. It's, it's very challenging for them, but having them focused on a local area, for example. I don't necessarily, and this isn't, this isn't relevant to an organisation or anything like that. Some of the challenges I found was sometimes you've got carers in the field trying to be responders. And that overlap there, I think, uh, interferes with their judgment at the time in the field. And there's some people that just, in saying it, they're not fit for task. Some people are not fit for task physically themselves to be out in the field doing that. Um, and they, their will and intentions and abilities could be used best elsewhere, still contributing to that disaster. Um, mm. In my organization being the fact that it's private, I, that's why, like I said in the presentation, I have people who are very specifically my boat operators their, their normal day is some people's worst day because their normal operations are salvage and mooring. So that's what they deal with. They're, they're working out in the ocean and in areas, recovering things that have sunk and underwater and the like. Um, so that's uh, you know, part of the business model. So I don't have the same challenges some of the other organisations have, even down to the, their ability to train in an environment on a regular basis, um, going and doing one course or someone going and doing a course, how, what's their level of exposure to that environment? And again, um, it's like fit for testing, phobia testing. Some people don't know how they're gonna react till they get out there and they're in the middle of it, then they become a victim themselves because of how it's affecting them. And it's, yeah. again, it's not a criticism, it's, it's just a fact. Um, I have worked well with some of the volunteer groups. I see the only challenges I find some of them might have is, um, how do you put it? The desired outcomes of some other groups, those other groups will then come to these willing participants and say, come on board and help us. And this is what we want the outcome to be. Mm. This, is, this is what we want the outcome to be. It's not a leveled, hey, we're going to assess it as an individual animal. We, it's like we're going to save everything mm. at all costs. Mm. And I feel yeah. like those, the groups offering assistance can be jaded thinking that they're being told 
it's just not transparent. The information they're getting isn't isn't appropriate, um, and they can sometimes be misguided and misled by groups yeah. on the ground here if they've come from elsewhere. And I think we've probably all encountered a few individual personalities that also tend to sort of you know drive these things too, which is inevitable in any kind of group. You'll have leaders with different motives, as you say. Um, Erica, is there anything else you want to add at this point? I've I've got yeah, um, some really um, good conversations here. I think that um, compared to America, uh, England, and, and probably many other countries that I am yet to get to know about their good work, um, we are still relatively immature as, uh, as a discipline. Um, academically, we're growing. Um, 10 years ago, we didn't have the academic research that we do now, maybe, say, 13 years ago. Um, and from a practical point of view, I think there's room for us to mature and grow into something new. And I think there's room for spontaneous volunteers there. Um, my thoughts are that we should lean into um, the information, expertise and experience of other countries and try and adopt where possible um, some of their, their lessons learned and their, you know, their valuable criteria for how to handle spontaneous volunteers. Um, and I think with, um, you know, human, human life being really important, um, of course it is. And I also think from a One Health and One Welfare approach that um, giving um, avenues for um, veterinary teams and assistance, technical animal rescue teams to come in and be a part of um, the response means that we can actually free up our emergency responders um, to do the work. And of course, there's gaps there for spontaneous volunteers to come in. Again, um, more lower risk uh, situations but taking um, taking their strengths into account, as, as you mentioned, Slade, you know, uh, establishing uh, what skill sets they've got. Sometimes we don't know until we ask. And a lot of it is expectation management at the start, similar to when we're employing our, our, our staff at work. It's, it's a similar idea. Um, and I think that there's also capacity for uh, volunteering organisations. So um, in WA, we have um, Volunteering WA that can help us to uh, orchestrate the volunteer um, capacity, help us with the background admin work uh, and those, those types of resourcing. So um, I don't think there's, there's too much more there, but I, I think we've got um, some exciting uh, stages ahead for us as a country. And um, it's great that we've got other countries that we can learn from as well. So I guess it's good to have an open mind um, and to think about, you know, that growth mindset and where we can go in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just going to encourage you once again to uh, start putting some questions in the q and I see we've got one thing there and I'm just wondering that. Um, we have got the great question here and I will we'll sort of start to try and bring, bring the audience in a bit more now if I can. Um, we're being asked, um, how do you handle the international veterinary support? Um, do you have national protocols? I don't know if anyone can take that one on. Um, I would say I had an international vet come over from a different group and they had done a bit of research prior to coming and they're obviously not used to working with Australian native animals and had done mm. a couple of short courses prior to arriving. Um, and my take on that would be um, vets beyond borders and the likes, if it was an international vet, if they partnered up with the likes of vets beyond borders or vets for compassion or that um, an already existent veterinary organisation that, you know, takes vets in that are willing to donate their time and assist, I would, I would say that would be the path to go down. Mm. Anyone else want to add anything? Yeah, um, spot on, um, Slade, absolutely. The uh, avenue is definitely through our international organisations. So if you specialise in wildlife, and even if you're not familiar with our wildlife species here, we still need you if you're, if you're trained to do that. Um, so coming on board um, with organisations that will assist, I'm not going to speak on behalf of them, but we have um, many different organisations that will, will take people. Um, when I say many, we've got three, which is big for us. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that's probably an offline discussion to ensure that those people are, are happy to take you, but definitely from um, Vets Beyond Borders, I could see that that would be an avenue, as Slade said. Uh, and the most important thing, you know, as per, you know, NIMS and, and AIMS here, um, everything goes through our hazard management agencies. So um, you'd need to ensure if you are a veterinary personnel that you're registered to come into that area. And that is something that the boards um, are very good, as I mentioned previously, at speeding up, making sure you do meet the criteria of course, um, and being able to work. But for our going into veterinary land, for our veterinarians who are wanting to come across and aren't necessarily um, 
not that you're not experienced, but you might just not meet the legislative and other criteria. Um, you can work as a nurse as well, and our nurses are quite adept and work at quite a high level, um, particularly in those specialised areas. So if you've got the skill sets, not just wildlife, but any area, even if you're not veterinary, um, then please, you know, do get in contact with, um, yeah, probably Vets Beyond Borders is the first, first port of call. Great. And, and probably to emphasise, I mean, the, the, the critical thing is there is no room for freelancing. End of story. You know, when, when you've got a major fire or a major flood event, you know, you, it's always got to go through something that plugs into that event. So, you know, moment we're doing a lot of training in New South Wales with vets to explain the incident control system. Um, here in Australia and New Zealand, we have a thing called AIMS. Um, they're now doing those courses so they know how an operation works and where they can plug in. But I just got to emphasize there's no room for freelancing because you're freelancing in uh, a very unsafe workplace. You just don't walk onto a workplace without a workplace safety induction to ensure you have the right PPE, et cetera, et cetera. A fire ground or a flood is my workplace. And it's a very dangerous, dynamic workplace. So, yeah, irrespective of big hearts. It's a very dangerous environment to work in. And we did, we want you to work in it, but you've got to work into it being plugged into a system. Mm -hmm. David, am I right in thinking that that um, New South Wales SES has got more sort of opportunities now for people in these sort of spaces that want to come and get involved more with the animal side of things? Oh, look, we've, we've had some enormous wins um, because some people yeah, want to actually just do animals. So within our training uh, pathways you can now join the SES and go down an animal rescue pathway and say I'm here to actually support animals and I've got a couple of people who have just recently joined our unit and they've just said I'm not here to do road crash rescue and vertical rescue and and storm damage I'm here to do animal rescue and to help animals and I just tick at there should be a lot more of it and Mel if I just a little thing yeah. The biggest problem is we have so many different legislations in, in Australia. In New South Wales, with hand and heart, we are so lucky because animals are clearly written into our legislation. So I have a legislated obligation to help animals in a crisis. If I go to Victoria, Western Australia, Northern Territory, Queensland, I struggle to find the word animals in their emergency legislation. They're the forgotten victims. So to overcome this, the members of the public with huge hearts go, we have to step in because the emergency services don't have a legislated obligation to take responsibility. So I'm very lucky in New South Wales. I have legislation that absolutely supports everything I do. I just feel so sorry for our other states who are struggling to get the emergency services engaged and therefore have to rely on our unofficial response to animals. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a complex web at the best of times, but certainly once you add in the state borders and a whole lot of other things, as we know with the registrations, as Erica mentioned, it's, uh, it gets more complex. I've got another question here for you. Uh, it says uh, this person, uh, Pedro, hello, Pedro. Um, I'm a veterinarian, also a firefighter. I understand all the risks in the field. I also agree that we need to have control of the freelance here in Chile, um, this is a very common different uh, in this is very common in different emergencies. So I think that's probably a, a bit of a, a support there um, from uh, from from South America too. Um, how how do we go with the veterinarians and the and the veterinary professionals? I'll probably put this one to Erica as a, as our sort of our veterinary professional in the audience. But you know we all appreciate I think here how how complex things are and how um, you know you don't know what you don't know and you can find yourself in the middle of it and and you know be very skilled but but i wouldn't say out of your depth because if you don't not aware of it you're not aware you're out of your depth perhaps but but you find yourself crossing boundaries that uh you never intended to and uh and that causes lots of sort of complexities potentially um yeah so um so um pop that into one statement for me what would you like me to cover i'm just wondering how we're getting on with um the veterinarians and incorporating them and making sure that they can they can support when they are able to 
um, and hopefully get recompensed yeah. for it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, really for us at the moment, uh, most of it is running through um, Vets Beyond Borders. And so um, they're running, uh, you know, AIMS training. Uh, I think that they're doing some bushfire safety um, work. Please don't quote me on that. Um, there's a lot more um, animal emergency management at conferences now. So I'm pleased to announce that the Vet Nurse Council are incredibly supportive and at their national conference every year they will nearly always have an animal emergency management talk so that our veterinary nurses have an idea of triage and also um, basic aims or awareness. There's room for growth in that as well. Um, and the same with the Australian Vet Association Conference. Um, certainly, uh, I think it was last year they had a big workshop getting practices to plan. So um, on two accounts, um, A, getting them prepared is a big part of it. So at the moment, there's a, a focus um, to get veterinary practices to get their plans in place so that they can actually respond even just at that local level, having that local emergency management focus, getting them involved with local emergency management arrangements, uh, going to the LEMC uh, meetings as we call them if possible, and to network with uh, their emergency services stakeholders, shelters, and you know all, all external stakeholders that are important. And particularly um, driving a community engagement focus with that so that we can, you know, the big dream is to obviously have every veterinary practice in Australia ready with plans and uh, of course uh, their, the homes as well of their staff prepared because we know from research that people don't uh, deploy well if they're not actually prepared at home. I know I certainly wouldn't, um, it, you know, your animals and your family, your children of course come first. Um, so that's from the, the local level um, and then from a larger level going in through um, organisations that accept volunteers such as Vets Beyond Borders and also some work associated, of course, um, in the official capacity with the state level plans and uh, Department of Primary Industries, um, Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development in WA. All of them have veterinarians, of course, in their facilities and starting to link into uh, other veterinarians in the area within that state for the regional and local level knowledge, which is incredibly important for their responses. And really the biggest thing for us, I think, as a whole, when we're thinking about response is fatigue management and having enough staff to come in and come through to assist staff or volunteers, however you'd like to term it. Uh, and so for us in the veterinary industry, we have, like many other industries, but we've got a bit of a crisis going on. Uh, not only do we have a wellness crisis and we're improving and working on that, that's important to note because we're putting our people into higher risk situations, uh, but also, uh, I lost the other point that I was going to make, but basically <laughs> getting them prepared and ready. Uh, that was the point, short staffing. So we need to be able to run our essential service. And as some of you might be aware, there's actually an inquiry going on in uh, New South Wales, I believe, at the moment on the vet shortage. So we need to be able to run our essential service for the community, um, for the community's resilience, even as a basic, let alone uh, when we're working in disasters. And so that's why, going back to the original topic, there is scope and room for uh, non-trained uh, non personnel to come in as spon spontaneous volunteers and help to fill smaller, smaller gaps. My last comment is that it's incredibly important that we have the right qualification, skill set and experience to the task that we're giving them. And that is why I'm um, going back to vet, vet disaster triage quickly. We're looking at having a push of having nurses, vet tech specialists and veterinary technicians do more of the triage work uh, and more of the work that they legally can do so that we can free our vets up to do the work that they are super uh, experienced and uh, have that expertise in. Mm. And we certainly heard from um, Anna Ludwig yesterday about some of the vets in the Northern Rivers and the sort of work that they were doing and that sort of local knowledge. And I recall from the Blue Mountains and the fires there, we had um, you know, local vets wanting to, who know the area, know the, the people wanting to go out and, and do the work locally, but hmm. having to leave their practices. So the idea of using the veterinary skills to backfill is a good one. Sorry, David. No, I was going to say, and um, this year, the um, Australian Veterinary Association through the Equine Veterinarians Australia, ran a two-day workshop down at the University of Melbourne, all around, uh, it was all about equids, but it, it basically in floods, fires, and, and those emergency incidents, and um, a lot of discussions on how vets can plug into these events, because it's often their area that's, that's impacted, and um, I think yeah, there's a lot coming, and I think we're in a good space with um, you know growing this capability of 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 having unofficial response. But let's make it a little bit more official response. 
rather yeah. than just um, yeah, the freelancing. I think there's some good opportunities coming. Yeah, I, I know one, one dilemma that we're talking about in the more broad, the broader sort of community, sort of self-organized community area is this idea that they call it a hedgehog dilemma, where the nearer, where official, uh, the official kind of interaction with these groups tends to push them to become more formalized, more sort of rigid um, and changes the very nature of them. And, and, and uh, in some ways kind of puts people off who've got different views or different, you know, I say different values in a broad sense, but you know, it just come from a different sort of culture in terms of what they want from, from their volunteering and how we can sort of take the best of things without sort of swamping it and, 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 and covering it in too much sort of formality and legislation and all the other things. I mean, maybe it's just about the, the roles that people do perhaps. Yep, yeah. but volunteering, you still gotta remember, you've still gotta ensure insurances because if somebody gets injured whilst you know swimming out in flood water thinking they're doing good work you know uh, you've got to ensure they are insured they have the right training the right ppc ppe uh, and that's probably the biggest thing for a lot of these um, little groups that do form with huge hearts they still got to ensure they have some organization around them and and that's where something like the ses can probably help those groups because then they've got somebody to be responsible to and somebody a group that can actually pass down all that information. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sort of a gentle holding of hands, maybe. Um, I'm going to sort of start to wrap up because we haven't got more questions coming, but I'm keen to kind of give you all an opportunity to, to add in anything that maybe has come to mind while we've been talking. So um, I don't know if anyone has a, has a view of that. And, and um, Gerardo, did you want to say something before we do that? Yeah, thank you. I just couldn't uh, type on a question. Um, in, in my past life, when we used to go to big disasters, very, very big ones, and I, uh, it reminded me uh, of this, the gentleman that spoke from Chile, um, you don't have the luxury of, of preparing the public, uh, but you do have, and this is what I wanted to, to ask your opinion about, the biggest luxury I could have was to to put to to put a communications uh, officer in the team to uh, work the social media to work the uh, interviews uh, television etc and explain the boundaries of the of the uh, operation explain um, the possibilities to uh, to help without obstructing really and uh, I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, I just want to quickly add as well that I remember at the panel last night, there was a comment that came up around the around sort of managing that void, that sort of vacuum in communication and how we need to, how how um, in the US in particular, they seem to be sort of really on the front foot with 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 them um, filling that so that the people weren't rushing in to to fill a void that really I wasn't visible to them, perhaps. Any... But I'll probably answer the thing. I mean, social media, um, I, I do a lot of the social media stuff during the floods. And um, I'm on a working group with Mel, which is all about, you know, having our, our we call it the animal ready community, ensuring our community is well informed of the risks of fire and flood. And therefore, we're constantly pushing the message to think about what are you going to do if we actually say there is going to be a flood. and um, uh, And in my messaging on social media, it's all about pushing that responsibility back to the owners to say, you really need to start getting out now. You, you've got days to move your livestock, do it now because you're not gonna have the time. And this avoids the whole need for people swimming out in flood water to rescue animals. So I 100% agree the importance of social media to actually get information out early and give people the information that they can make their informed decisions. And I'm constantly warning people about don't go into flood water because of that biological risk as well. So um, yeah, I 100% the social media is absolutely prime these days in keeping our community informed. And I, I guess good thing is I've got an animal bias. So I get to put that message out in all of our social media wherever mm, possible. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Um, any other sort of comments either on this or final comments? Um, Slade, I know we haven't given you much chance to, to speak lately. Yeah. No, no, no. Um, there's a question for you, David, there as well to finish up with. Um, so one of the things in the field I've found, and I think Dave's found the same, and I, um, 
sometimes so many people operationally on the front line, it's such a great risk, but the problems can be, you'll pull animals out, you'll get them back, but trying to have that triage and where do you put them once you bring them back? Mm. Like some of these large animal evac centers, the one we staged for the fires, yes, that was reasonably central to where the fires are impacting. Not at risk at all, reasonably central, but still a bit of a distance. When the floods are coming through, the evac center is a substantial distance away. You've got owners coming back in with their animals. I think moving forward, the, like Erica was saying, having that veterinary and vet nurse capability. So for example, if I'm in the field and we're bringing animals back in and we're engaged for that capacity because we chop and change what we're doing uh, you know, from day to day, that then takes up resources and I've got to try and turn people back around, have them back out on the front line doing assessments and bringing animals back in. So I did notice that with the fires, having suitable people in a triage environment and in trying to ensure that they were competent and qualified in what they were doing. So not necessarily having them out on the fire line or doing that immediate assessment, but even bring, having animals brought back in for assessment, euthanasia, you know, that clinical uh, a proper clinical assessment that fell short a little bit so I think moving forward that would be really good and I don't having a huge number of more boats in the water or people on the front line can I think it's great to preserve life but sometimes it's like a car park at Woolworths if you've got so many people I don't know what your <laughs> thoughts are on that Dave Yeah. I know that's pretty blunt. I'm a bit blunt about it. But it's wondering it's, if they know what Woolworths is. It's a shopping centre <laughs> for food. <laughs> and you might get some other things there. A little bit like mini Walmart. Um, if I can jump in, Slade, are you, are you, are you Dave familiar doesn't to want to that? say anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned about Woolies. Everyone knows about Woolies now. Um, so, yeah, I think for the social media, um, I uh, completely agree with um, David that really the community engagement focus is peacetime. And I think most of us know that. All of us probably do. Um, and that it really is your messaging all the time because what we're talking about is building culture as well. So that safety awareness in the community and uh, more and more people are getting prepared. Unfortunately, it's sometimes for the wrong reasons because they're experiencing or someone that they know has experienced a uh, perhaps even just a level two, level three emergency before it goes into disaster. But nevertheless, community engagement in that peacetime um, phase is important. Um, and I think from the response and recovery uh, phases, um, there, there's a little bit more growth that needs to happen in terms of um, governments and maturing with their plans. Because of course, every time you practice that plan, you've got new things to add to it as well. And it's complex, as we know, at that state level. And then we've got the uh, the regional and local uh, planning around that as well. So the messaging uh, for Western Australia for animals and emergencies is certainly improving and looks a lot different now to what it did 10, 20 years ago. Um, there will be animal messaging in there. Does that cover off on our spontaneous volunteers? No, not specifically, because that's probably something that would be handled separately behind the scenes. Um, but certainly I think social social media is super important. Um, it might be the same for other countries, I'm not sure, but in Australia, uh, the media liaison officer under our AIMS incident command structure is the uh, author, uh, authorised officer to be able to put that information out. And so from a response point of view, for all of our veterinary teams uh, and any other teams that have officially deployed, uh, they have to be very careful about what they're saying in terms of that emergency. Uh, so they can probably speak a little bit to um, general messaging in terms of the animals, um, but when they're going into the incident support group meetings and they're messaging back through their chain of command, um, they really want to try and send that through to the media liaison officer so that it's going out in a timely, uh, timely response. And again, we find that's getting better and better and you in Australia, we'll also see differences between the states and territories because not every single uh, state and territory in Australia has uh, a matured plan. And that's purely because of A, the planning perhaps that they've got in place and also because of the risks associated with it uh, and, and how many times they've had to, uh, you know, practice that. So, yeah. Fair it. enough. Um, David, do you want to take that question finally and then I'll close up? 
Uh, look, uh, the question about um, is, is joining the SES and um, at the moment the bias across to, to the rescue units. Yes, in we've got to look at the legislation side. Um, throughout New South Wales, all of our general land rescue units have a le legislated responsibility to rescue animals. The units that aren't, their next bit of legislation is during flood. So at the moment, I'm training all of our flood rescue operators to be able to approach, restrain and relocate animals in flood water. There is actually no sort of animal program within the SES outside of those two areas yet. And so the key thing is it's the legislation sort of drives what we're doing. The other thing to remember in legislation in New South Wales, under the emergency um, planning side of things, once an event becomes a disaster, we subby that out or RFS subbies that whole animal structure to the animal functional services. So in actual fact, it becomes Department of Primary Industries, local land services, um, Animal Welfare League, et cetera. And they basically take on the responsibility for animals. So they set up our animal evacuation centers. They have limited resource, but that's where they then mm. contract people like Slade on their behalf to actually undertake all those actions. So in New South Wales, um, we need to be able to get those groups plugging into Department of Primary Industry who then coordinate the whole animal response on behalf of the SES during a flood. But the good thing is we've got that clearly defined in legislation. Mm -hmm. So reality in a big flood, we don't have a role SES wise to be going out and manage those animals. We can then do the rescue side because it's legislated that we do rescue. Uh, but reality is all that feeding in place and veterinary care, euthanasia, et cetera, et cetera, is all subbed out to um, to that whole functional area, which is which is what all the states should actually have. Absolutely clarity in legislation, clarity of role. And that impacts down into SES wise that at the moment, our key legislated role is rescue, general land rescue for all those incidents, horses in septic tanks, horses in mud, et cetera, or during a flood, helping move people and animals from actual or threatened danger or harm from flood water. So outside of that, yeah, we don't really have SES training and roles. Yeah, great. Thank you. I'm going to have to start wrap. I'm going to have to wrap up now. Uh, uh, Harada needs to uh, get to bed, and I'm sure our, um, our attendees need to uh, get lunch or dinner or or, um, or more sleep, perhaps depending where they are. Um, firstly, um, I just want to say that I think you know all of us have seen some massive changes. Um, over the last 10 years, as, as I know Erica and others have, have already said in this panel, um, you know, we see lots of positive things happening. And, you know, we've got a smaller scale, I think, here, which is, is clearly something that makes it a bit more tricky. And we've got a large country to cover, uh, which makes distances, um, you know, longer and, and harder for unfunded and you know, less funded sort of operations, I think. Um, so uh, the other thing I would like to say is, again, it's been sort of started to be picked up a bit. I think we talk a lot about response. As David said, we, you know, we really need to be pushing a lot more into that preparedness um, space and the mitigation element, element so that the response isn't as, it doesn't need to be as big. Um, and also, I think we do need to get some maturity in the kind of some of that social media and other kind of media coverage around the fact that not all animals survive. So you can do the heroic stuff, but it doesn't always end up with actually a positive outcome beyond that immediate survival. And survival, as we know, is only just the beginning really for a lot of people. And I think Anna yesterday um, in, her comp in her stuff just told us a lot about the things that come up for animals after um, the initial survival of the hazard itself. So I do think we need to bear all of that in mind when we're, we're thinking about better ways to do this sort of stuff. Um, okay, so I'd just like to say thank you everybody who's, um, who's held on. I think we managed to sort of get short of, short of an hour in the end, just about.